Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So it feels like a good day for a Q&A. So uh, let's jump right in. 10,000 subscribers. Thank you, each and every one of you who have subscribed to the channel and really supported this channel since uh, it really ramped up last year in March, really right at the start of the pandemic. Uh, it's really helped me keep going to have all of your constant questions and support. Uh, it's been fantastic, just uh, the community that's been built here. Uh, so thank you for that. With that, let's jump in to the questions for this week. Yes, I am on. It's not gonna be a 10 day, it's gonna be a seven day green smoothie cleanse, okay? It's going pretty well. Um, you know, there's a lot of fruit in the shakes, the particular cleanse that, that we decided to do. Uh, so, I don't know, I could use a little bit more fat. I'm missing fat, I'm missing warm food that I have to chew. I'm very excited uh, to revisit that experience. Uh, congratulations, thank you. Question, if you don't mind, what are your thoughts on ASUS? So I've actually gotten a lot of uh, feedback about ASUS or uh, messages to revisit ASUS. I guess it's come down quite a bit since I did my last video on ASUS after I found out uh, Nick Sleep bought ASUS after selling out half of a position in Amazon. Uh, ASUS, I didn't get very deep into ASUS before I realized, you know, this isn't really a business that I'm interested in. It's, it's a fashion kind of e-commerce business it just doesn't uh, I don't have any interest in fashion okay so it's hard for me to get excited about digging into a company like Asus um, but could certainly be a compelling investment opportunity now given how much the price has come down uh, of course we can't see if Nick Sleep owns it because he's investing in it through his personal account and so he doesn't show up as an owner. Um, so, you know, that, that makes it a bit more risky, in my opinion. It's not, not exactly a clone because we can't see when he gets out. Uh, so just a, a couple thoughts there. Uh, quite stupid question. That's fine. Uh, it bugs me for some time already. Will you prefer 20% when the S&P returns 22%? or 18% when the S&P returns 16%. So the question here is really, am I more interested in absolute performance for my own account or that I'm beating the market? Uh, and this is really an inner scorecard question. I would take 20% when the market is doing 22% versus 18% you know, when the market does 16% because you know, inner scorecard, right? At the end of the day, getting to my financial freedom number has nothing to do with what the S&P 500 does. It's what I'm able to do in my personal account, right? So um, it is an interesting question. I think there's a lot of people who uh, compare with the S&P 500. I think there's value to that over the long run, right? On a year to year basis, I mean, give me 20 to 20% 20 when the market does 22%. Um, but, you know, if, if five, 10 years go by and you're underperforming the market, uh, you know, I think the rational thing to do at that point is to look at yourself and say, hey, maybe I just don't have the skill. I don't have what it takes to outperform the market. I should just join the market. So, on a year-to-year -year basis, I have no problem underperforming the market. If that's happening over time, you know, the, the rational decision at that point is just to say, okay, I'm just going to invest in the S&P and, you know, sip, sip daiquiris at the beach. You know, I, I don't need to do all this work uh, if it's not actually resulting in outperformance. If Pabrai and Munger both sell out of Alibaba in quarter three at a loss without revealing why, that would be interesting. What is your key insight into Alibaba that will allow you to hold on to it despite the exodus of super investors? 
Um, so investors sell for many reasons. Okay, it's the same with business owners. You look at insider, you know, activity. You don't really know why someone is selling. Okay, There's, there aren't too many reasons for someone to buy. You know, I, you've got to like the investment prospects, right, of, of the business. Um, so I think my edge here, it's not, it's not. Uh, an analytical edge. It's not that I have more information than these super investors. My edge is patience, okay? Uh, extreme patience. So at this point, I plan to hold Alibaba for at least a decade. So, you know, but, you know, part of why I got into Alibaba, part of what nudged me kind of over the hump, I had been looking at Alibaba, it was on my watch list. But seeing Munger buy it, that really kind of pushed me over the hump, okay? Um, so if Munger sells, I've really got to do, I, I've got to do some work on that. I've got to figure out, okay, uh, Munger really nudged me into this position in the first place. He got me over the hump. So if he's moving away from Baba, if he's exiting, um, maybe I should as well, okay? So it would definitely necessitate some digging if that happens, uh, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to just sell if Pabrai or Munger sell out of Baba. Um, it's going to be a more thoughtful process than that. Uh, but at, at the moment, I, I have no plans to to sell Alibaba. I haven't even been tracking it very closely because it's it's one of these long term bets, right? It's one of these coffee can portfolio bets um, where I think, you know, constant tracking what the company is doing can actually work against that approach, that long-term coffee can approach. Because, uh, you know, business, business results go up and down, right? They fluctuate. Uh, but the real gains in the portfolio for a long-term investor is to hold and, and capture those compound returns, which you can only do if you hold through the ups and downs of, of the business. Uh, thank you for the congrats on the 10K, very excited. Uh, which fund managers would you shamelessly clone that are not on Dataroma? So you probably asked that because you saw I put out a video recently uh, digging into great investor performance, right? Not just big investors, uh, but investors that are managing much smaller sums, right? Like single millions. Um, so a couple that stood out, Rob Vinal, um, you know, 13 years, almost 20% annual gains. Uh, impressive. Terry Smith is not on Dataroma. Also somebody I'm, I've added to my tracking list. Uh, Rosenblum is somebody I've been tracking for a while. Matt Peterson. Uh, you know, we can't see Matt Peterson's 13 Fs because he's managing under 100 million. Uh, but he shared a number of his holdings in the last annual meeting for, for Peterson funds. So that was, that was fun to see that. Um, who else? Simon Bernard. So this is a Fundsmith's kind of small and mid cap fund. Okay, I'm very interested in this. Actually, Monthly, they release a fact sheet for Smithson. And I'm going to be looking each month to see if they're adding any new positions uh, with that. So you guys will be about the first to know when I uh, uncover something there. Just three years of performance, so you know, not a lot we can take away from this. Uh, but the framework makes sense to me. So that's why I'm particularly interested in what new opportunities turn up through Smithson. Uh, Hayden Capital, Fred Liu, I'm very interested in that one. Uh, Alta Fox has been on my radar for a little bit, just an insane performance over the last three years. Again, just three years, um, but very interested to see what Connor is able to do over the next decade or two. Uh, Jason Donville, that's the ROE reporter. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, you know, 13 years, almost 18%, pretty solid. Scott Miller, Greenhaven, you know, there's just so many. Uh, towards the end here, uh, Adam Wyden, uh, nine years, 
33.3%. Uh, and one more I just want to give a shout out to is uh, Domo Capital. Actually, they're in Wisconsin, which is where I grew up. So interesting to see a, a smaller fund in Wisconsin with, which, with numbers that are, are very impressive over the last 13 years. So, uh, so much here. Uh, there's going to be a lot more that I'm going to add to this, I'm sure. It's, it's been amazing, the feedback, posting both on YouTube and on Twitter, just hearing from you guys. Who are your uh, favorite managers to clone? So if any of you have any that aren't on the list, hit me up in the comments for this video as well. Okay, have you come across a stock right up on Racis? Uh, I have not. I've only sort of seen what Pabrai has said about the company, which is quite a bit over the last probably six months of um, maybe year, last year of Q&A sessions that he does with business schools and individuals around the world. So those are all on YouTube. So check those out. Um, haven't come up, haven't, haven't come across a write up on racist um, other than what Pabrai has said about it. Uh, let's see. What are your thoughts on picking stock ideas from Morningstar, Five Star, and Wide Moat stocks? Yeah, um, I haven't looked too much at that. Um, yeah, I, I don't put a lot of confidence personally into star ratings from Morningstar or Wide Moat on Morningstar. Uh, I really want to dig a little deeper on the business than just a, a quantitative factor like that. Um, so I, I haven't looked at that. I have an uncle who swears by, you know, using about six or seven different metrics from Morningstar and and quite actively trading stocks using that. Um, but I haven't talked to him recently. I don't know how that's going for him. And trading just, it, it's not my approach. So um, yeah, not something I've really looked into. I share your stance towards certain businesses such as banks. Would you nonetheless consider shamelessly cloning if your favorite super investors all bought a bank? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I still think no, okay? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think I would just be too, too uncomfortable with, you know, how much can be hidden by banks. Uh, it's, it's so difficult to really understand what it is that a bank owns and what potential risks are there in in the assets that are owned by these banks. So I think, you know, it's probably just for me, banks are a no-go. Uh, I think that's probably what I'm going to stick to. But it, it would be interesting if, you know, Pabrai and Lee Lu and Charlie Munger and, you know, Buffett, they all bought a bank, right? It all shows up in the 13 Fs for one quarter. Um, I don't know. I'm not totally sure how I would respond to that. We, we might find out someday. Um, what do you think about using options as a tool for value investing, like selling puts for premium on already heavily discounted stocks? I think it's a fantastic approach. This is something that Matt Peterson does. Uh, it sounds like it's a, a core approach to Peterson funds where you know, say they want to build a position in Seritage Growth Properties, they'll sell puts on Seritage. Um, and then if they're put the shares, uh, they're effectively buying at, you know, the, the price that they sold the puts for minus the premium that they collected, right? So it's, it's just an additional discount. Um, and if the price doesn't get down to where they're put the shares, uh, they're still they're collecting premiums on it, and you guys should really watch his latest annual meeting, where he goes through. I think it was Seritage, where he was talking about how the premium on Seritage, you know, it was just such an incredible return, just collecting the premium um, for the cash that had to be put up for selling those put options. 
uh, it was it was impressive, very impressive returns, uh, even if he never takes hold of the stock. So I think it's a great strategy. I know Phil Town does it as well. Uh, it's something on my list of things to learn more about, how to actually implement that uh, in an intelligent and low-risk way. So uh, I am intrigued by that. What do you think about using simply Wall Street to value stocks? They take all the numbers and do the calculations for every company. Yeah, anytime you're, you're counting on a service to value a company, um, I think it's, it's going to be difficult to uh, generate any kind of outperformance doing that, right? Because all of that information is there for everyone else to see. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's usually just consensus information about how to value a company, right? Uh, the way you make money investing is to have, uh, what is it called? A, um, I forget the word, the term. You, you have to have uh, an insight about a company that differs from the herd, right? That's, that's how you, you've got to be a contrarian in a sense where you hold a different view about how things are going to play out for a company. Uh, and I haven't looked at simply Wall Street and how they value companies. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's going to be tough to gain any kind of edge using information like that. I think you really have to have key insights about a company that aren't held uh, by most investors, or you've got to, you know, shamelessly clone, right? Find the smartest investors in the room, the best business analysts out there, uh, and use that as a starting point. So that to me is much more interesting than using a service like Morningstar or Value Line or simply Wall Street to to look at their valuations compared to the current stock price. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult to outperform over time using those methods. Uh, which younger, smaller fund managers are you following and trying to learn from? Yep, so I, I shared that spreadsheet. Um, and in the video where I talk about, you know, which investors are worthy of shameless cloning, I, I also put a link to that spreadsheet in there so you guys can check that out. Uh, is there anyone in this space you recommend to analyze and study for ideas specifically around micro and small cap companies? I appreciate the research and content from you and all the PCI team. Um, yeah, for that, I mean, you're probably going to need to find managers that have, you know, under 100 million, under 50 million uh, in assets. So um, maybe not even that small, right? Under 500 million. So kind of my rule of thumb, if, you, if you're managing a $500 million fund, uh, you can put 10% of the fund, uh, that's 50 million, right? So in order to put 50 million in a company, it probably has to have around a 500 million market cap, okay? Uh, if you own more than 10% of it, uh, you just run into some, some headaches uh, in terms of reporting. And, um, you know, if you're trying to buy more than 10% of a company, that can really impact the stock price uh, as you buy, it can really put pressure, upward pressure on, on the stock price. So uh, rule of thumb, if you're managing a $10 million fund, you can comfortably look at businesses that have a $10 million or higher market cap. So um, I guess by that logic, any of these managers that are managing maybe say 250 million or less, you know, can get into some of the, the, the micro cap companies. I think micro cap is usually defined as under 300 million. So uh, take a look, dig into some of these, these fund managers that are managing smaller sums. There, there's plenty in here. And I plan on doing a lot of digging around that as well. So much more to come on that. Okay, let's see. What are your long-term goals in the investing space, i.e. full-term stock market investing and ditch your career or investing as a side hustle along with YouTube? Thanks again for all your videos. Um, 
Yeah, long-term goals in the investing space. I should really come up with some of those, shouldn't I? Um, really, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of feeling out the space. Like, how do I want to be? What is my relationship with investing? Okay, I don't have a clear vision of where I want to be in 20 years or anything like that. I'm enjoying myself. I'm enjoying learning about how to be a better investor. Um, YouTube, I'm enjoying as well. You know, coming up with content on here. You know, they're, they're both just really fun games to me right now. So um, I haven't turned either of them into a business at the moment. Uh, so I'm sure that will evolve at some point. Uh, but I don't know what that's going to look like. And I'm just going to keep enjoying both both hustles uh, until I don't enjoy them anymore. And maybe they'll morph into more of a business kind of structure. Um, but I don't have any business plan per se uh, in terms of, you know, what I want them to evolve into. Have you read Poor Charlie's Almanac? Yes. Uh, what actionable insights did you draw? Oh, man. There's just so much. There's so much. Uh, there's, there's no single thing jumping out at me in the moment. Um, I like what Pabrai says about poor Charlie's Almanac. Every time he reads it, you know, there's things he, he could have sworn he's never read before. Okay? It's just so dense with wisdom. So... Uh, nothing I can kind of pull out of my hat on the spot, but all of you should read Poor Charlie's Almanac. Do you watch any investing YouTube channels besides the folks on Punch Card and Monish Pabrai? Um, not regularly. Not regularly. With Pabrai, you know, I've got notifications set. I get pinged immediately when he releases a video and I watch it most of the time in the same day, right, that I'm notified. Um, there aren't any other channels that I watch regularly other than my boys on Punch Card. So hopefully I can maybe add uh, to that list over time, uh, find some, some gems out there. Do you consider a business has a moat even if that business has customer concentration? Do you consider a business has a moat even if that business has customer concentration? I'm not sure what that means, Oliver. Uh, maybe you can expand that for me for the next Q&A. At what point would you adjust your portfolio for short-term economic events? Thinking about what's going on in China right now and whether you would ever move to a higher cash position as a result. Um, yeah, I really try not to base portfolio decisions on short-term economic events because I do not trust myself to be able to forecast what's going to happen in the short term. Uh, and I have very little confidence in anyone else, quite frankly, to be able to do that. So um, yeah, short term really just isn't my game. Uh, I think it's, it's a much more difficult game. I think there, I'm much more prone to errors when I try to play short term games. And it's just more stressful, right? It doesn't suit my temperament. So. Uh, there, I don't think there, there's no point where I would try to adjust my portfolio. If there became a point and I, I tried to adjust it based on short-term things, it would probably be a mistake. Um, and hopefully I would learn from that. Have you found any Apex spawners lately? No, I have not. And honestly, guys, I haven't really been digging into individual businesses much lately. I've been much more focused on you know, learning from other great investors, um, kind of picking up the core investing principles from them as opposed to doing deep dives on individual businesses. So that's just where I've been uh, over the last couple of months. What metric made Amazon bullish in its low period if it wasn't? Jesse, I think you asked the ex it the exact same way last time. I still don't know what you mean. Uh, what metric made Amazon bullish? Am made Amazon bullish? Made investors in Amazon bullish? Um, 
I mean, Amazon, the, the thing that excites, would excite me about Amazon is not the P.E. ratio, right? I, I think last time I looked, the P.E. ratio was in the 70s, maybe. Uh, the, the incredible thing about Amazon is, you know, how durable the business is. I think, you know, I don't, was it Amazon? It was, there's a metric that Nick Sleep really liked. I think maybe robustness ratio which is, you know, how many dollars does a company save their customers for each dollar that the company earns, okay? And Amazon is incredibly good at that in terms of um, saving customers money, where, you know, as opposed to if customers had gone with an alternative for the same product, uh, Amazon is usually far and away the cheapest and most convenient option, uh, which is just huge for you know creating a, a business that has resilience over decades and decades. Um, also, cloud, right? Amazon is still early in cloud, right? And cloud is a it's a very high margin business. So, uh, I think most investors who are in Amazon are in it not because it looks cheap now but because of the runway that they see for Amazon. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think anyone's investing in Amazon because of the P.E. ratio. That's, that's not what people are paying attention to. Uh, it's really this, this compounding potential over time, uh, growing retained earnings, reinvesting in, you know, high return ventures. Uh, under the Amazon umbrella. What's the dumbest thing you've ever done in your investing career? Well, I don't know that I call investing a career, but um, as an investor, the dumbest thing, you know, I've said this before, it was selling Apple, right? I owned Apple, I think in 2015. I sold it a year later. It did well, it went up like 60%, I think. But I didn't have the framework yet of the coffee can or, you know, treating the business as a business owner, right? Where you're, you're just holding, right? Knowing that that's how compounding, that's how the magic happens is when you buy into a great business and you get out of the way. You let that business, you let that great business compound your money for you over years and years and years. That's how wealth, that's how riches are made. Uh, as an investor in the stock market. Uh, yes, there are many impersonators in the comments. It's, it's quite unfortunate. Um, I just can't keep up. I wish, I wish Google, I wish YouTube would put a little bit more effort on uh, curtailing this kind of behavior. But, you know, every, every time I see it, I go, I, I hide user from channel. Uh, and then they, they just go and they create another account that looks like mine and, and do the same thing. I will never give you guys a WhatsApp number to call, okay? If you see that on my channel ever, if you see that on 99% of other channels, it's just a scam, okay? So uh, the best thing you guys can do to help me out, help other creators out, is to report it, okay? There's a, you can go next to it because uh, you guys can't hide it from the channel, but I think you can report. Okay, so just hit that report. Hopefully YouTube's gonna get better at this over time. This is pretty dodgy. We got a brand Kellner here, right? Really branding themselves. Um, so it's just kind of a pain right now. Hopefully YouTube gets it under control at some point, but it's what we gotta deal with at the moment. But anyway, guys, thank you for all of your questions on this week's Q&A. Uh, thank you so much for all of your support, getting to 10,000 subscribers. I'm very excited for what lays ahead for the channel, for this community. Uh, we're building something special here. So thanks again, and I will see you all in the next video. Take care.